Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, greetings from uh, Liverpool. Uh, hello to everyone who's in the room here in, uh, in Merseyside, but also hello to our global audience and welcome to this session on uh, regulation for safer nicotine uh, products. Um, I hope you've had chance to uh, review the presentations uh, from Robin, uh, Jeannie and Greg, who hopefully will appear on the screen in a minute. Um, we also have uh, my side here helping, helping us manage the session, but also going to be a contributor is uh, Rebecca Taylor, former member of the European uh, Parliament and uh, actually quite an inspiring health campaigner. Um, so we've got a good we've got a good panel here. We're going to try and get into the questions about what is the appropriate form of regulation for safer nicotine products. What are we actually trying? What are regulators actually trying to do? Are, are, are they trying to reduce harm? Are they trying to improve well-being? Uh, are they trying to end the epidemic of tobacco use? End the create a nicotine-free society? Uh, are they trying to protect kids? Are they trying to close down the tobacco industry? industry or what. So we, we're going to have some discussion about what regulators are trying to achieve, what could possibly go wrong in uh, regulation if you, if you don't quite know what you're doing and how regulators are capable of making things worse, what the different institutions are doing. We've got an expert on WHO here in Genie, and we've got a, an expert on the US institutions in the, in the form of, of Greg. And we've got somebody who's been engaged very heavily with the Food and Drug Administration in the form of Robin. So we've got a great sort of expert panel. Um, I'm going to kick off uh, by just putting a quick question to each of them. We want good questions coming in from our international audience and here in the audience, okay, here in the live audience here in Liverpool. So do think about what you want to do, be as challenging and pressing as you, as you like, uh, put yourself in the minds of the critics that attack us in this area and we'll try and air some of the, uh, some of the big issues. Um, good, so I'm going to start with Robin. Um, uh, Robin Gougelet from Pinney Associates. Um, uh, do you want to just introduce yourself, Robin? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm Robin Gougelet. I work with Pinney Associates uh, and we consult for Jewel Labs. Um, before that, worked with BAT and Reynolds on their non combustible products, um, never on combustible cigarettes. And I work um, on health policy and, and uh, regulation, as Clive mentioned. I've done a lot of work on supporting um, applications to FDA and uh, in our prior role, um, worked to prepare for a TIPSAC as well, which was uh, one of the modified risk tobacco products steps to, uh, to get there. Now, Robin's presentation, I thought, raised one of the most interesting issues in the, in the area of regulation, which is to do with um, nicotine. Um, and basically, there's a regulatory tradition of talking about addiction or dependence forming as, quotes, abuse liability. So the question is, is that a problem uh, with vaping or heated or other smoke-free alternatives to cigarettes? Or is it a feature? Is it a bug or is it a feature? Um, so Robin, what, what, did, what conclusion did you come to on this sort of colliding worlds of regulation? One that says, actually, if it's addictive, that's a problem. And then the other that says, if it's addictive, it's not a problem because it's a useless alternative to cigarettes. How did you come out on that? Um, well, it really depends on who's using the products. So um, for people who aren't current smokers, uh, products that have high abuse liability that deliver a lot of nicotine in a satisfying way um, can be problematic. Um, but for people who smoke, having a product that has uh, high abuse liability um, that delivers nicotine in a satisfying way that they want to use that has features um, other than nicotine delivery that they like um, is a positive thing. Um, so I think abuse liability is uh, a useful regulatory framework, but I think um, it's, it's definitely important for um, in creating alternatives uh, to cigarettes to make sure that they're competitive um, with cigarettes um, in a variety of ways, and, and nicotine delivery is incredibly important in that. But what do you say to the, the critics who would say, 
you know, your, your idea of something that's competitive with cigarettes is, you know, just another way of addicting my, you know, teenage son uh, and recruiting him into to Juul and ultimately to Altria. What, what, what's your response to the idea that actually we call it abuse liability for a reason, mm. and that's because these products are dependence forming or depending on your definition, addictive? Yeah. Um Tough question. Uh, I, I mean, I don't think that um, kids and adolescents should use psychoactive substances. Um, you know, personally, if if I had a kid and I don't, uh, I would prefer that they use nicotine in a non-combustible form than in a cigarette um, because it's still uh, the most addictive, highest abuse liability product. Um, but I think uh, that there have been a lot of measures in the, in the last couple of years, especially in in the states um, that can that have been shown to effectively uh, address youth use through um, access and, and trying to make sure uh, that it's it's not as easy to, for kids to get their hands on these products. Um, but I think ultimately uh, the the most dangerous form of nicotine use is transitioning into a lifetime of of cigarette smoking, um, and that's what concerns me most is is dependence on on the most harmful form. Where do you think, if, if, a, if a teenager takes up vaping, I mean, how do you think we should think about that in terms of the risk that they're taking? Is it addictive? Should we use, even use the term addictive to describe vaping? Is it addictive in the classic definitions? And how does it compare to the sort of range of things that uh, teenagers or adolescents do or are exposed to? I mean, where do you put it in the kind of spectrum of stuff that kids do? Um, definitely has dependence potential for sure. Uh, you know, nicotine, um, depending on how quickly and in what form it's delivered, can be addictive for sure. Uh, in terms of the range of other behaviors, um, you know, I, I am much more. Um, I would be worried as a parent about uh, binge drinking, sexual violence, um, mental health concerns. Uh, so, you know, it's it's part of a, a range of behaviors that I think adolescents um, engage in uh, as as part of growing up. And um, but I think. Uh, definitely is potential for, for dependence within these products. All right, and my final question to you, on what, at one point FDA basically, because one, one argument is that actually vaping is good for harm <laughs> reduction in adolescents under 18, uh, that, and there's some evidence that kids use, you know, use products, uh, vaping products uh, to stop smoking, to be less intrusive, to have less stigma and so on. What do you think of the harm reduction apply, uh, argument applied to teenagers? I don't think harm reduction starts the day that you turn 18. You know, if you're um, a, a person who smokes who's under 18, you deserve the right to harm reduction just as much as an adult does. Um, I think in, in places that we've seen uh, the most success um, in, in Scandinavia and, and people moving from cigarettes to non-combustible alternatives, uh, a lot of that has been around alternative initiation, which is um, certainly a, an uncomfortable topic. Um, but I do think it is still harm reduction if people, um, even those underage, were to smoke or are smoking, um, start or switch to a less harmful form of nicotine. Okay, great. My views. Very good. Let's let's move on to Jeannie now. So Jeannie, your your presentation I think very helpfully sort of showed us how we must make distinctions between the FCTC as a legal text, the conference of the parties and the, the decisions it comes to, the Framework Convention Secretariat, which sort of manages that process, and WHO, which is a, a, a large and influential body, but is in many ways separate from the uh, FCTC and the Secretariat. But one thing I thought was eye-catching is that you said you thought the FCTC was fit for purpose. Okay, but at the same time, we have WHO giving awards to the Indian health minister for prohibiting e-cigarettes outright, which I think probably most of us in this audience and worldwide would think was a completely lunatic idea. So 
what's good and what's bad about that kind of architecture of the FCTC, the Secretariat, maybe TOBREG, the WHO? What's working and what's not working? What kind of things could we do to fix it? Yes, well, it's certainly important to separate out what these things are and then understand them because it's only with that understanding that you can come to what's needed. Um, and the FCTC, as you said, it is a document. It's a, it's a legal piece of paper. And that is, even though it was negotiated by 193 governments under the auspices of of the WHO as as the, the host. It is not owned, it's not the WHO's document, it is, it is the document of the parties, which is the national governments, that are party to that treaty. So one is, um, the, as I said, the, the WHO, and then you've got, um, and it can say and do what it likes institutionally, but it has no decision-making ability from that document at all. That is entirely the domain of national governments. And I think Derek Yak, in his speech earlier, said, um, said it very well when he said when it was negotiated and he being an architect of it, um, during that time, you know, it, it took, you have to remember, it took three um, years to negotiate in six official UN languages and it was governments there negotiating. They were putting forward the text. So all the little bits that are in there, like harm reduction is in there, mm. like there's, it, it did predict for the future because it said if there are scientific developments in the future, these are what governments should should look to. Um, the the main thing that I think is in there that is really important, and this is why I think it's totally fit for purpose, is that its whole premise is built on the fact that it's the protection from exposure to tobacco smoke. That why why that is it is written so many times through the treaty. It is in the objective. It's in the opening section. It says smoke is carcinogenic, mutagenic, all those things I said in my talk. So it's a matter of understanding that governments have a legal obligation to do what is in that treaty and using those hooks rather than tossing it out and saying let's start again. It is possible to add an annex to the FCTC under Article 29, which you could put things into. But I think, um, to, to just finish, um, it's, a, it's a matter of going back to those basics, understanding the difference of the institutions, but also understanding that political side of things, that of course, you know, the WHO and Bloomberg and others are trying to go one way, it's important to understand that the governments and the text to which they are bound mm. um, actually provisions for this area and it's a matter of knowing and understanding those which will enable it's very much fit for purpose. Um, the human rights aspects that are in it, the um, surveillance that's in it, governments are required every two years to put in up-to-date information. So the last panel we heard that many countries aren't doing that. Well then it's a matter of saying, why are you not doing this, et cetera. So there's a lot in there. I, 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 I think the FCTC more now than ever has a lot of um, potential um, as, we, as we go forward, if it is understood and used correctly. Mm. So your, your view is essentially that it's, it's an instrument that could be used to generalise good policy uh, and put, put sort of authority behind good policy if that's what the member states chose to do. Yes. And um, in particular, if they were encouraged to do that by the Secretariat. Um, but but it, it doesn't require a treaty change exactly. to be pro-harm reduction. Exactly. And you see governments that are doing that. I mean, the Philippines government, just, mm. just this within this last four weeks, um, has, has a, a Congress bill which says that, you know, it's, it's harm reduction is at the core of everything. And that piece of that, that Congress um, legislation, it would be everything anyone who's interested in harm reduction would want. New Zealand has equally done the same legislation recently between combustion and non-combustion. And I think that's the way to look at the FCTC. It really does set out, it doesn't say combustion, non-combustion, it says smoke. Um, it, it doesn't go into the depths of nicotine or any of those areas we, um, we discuss with a lot of depth now, because it's a framework and it's a framework for, of interpretation. And I think therefore, um, look at that and as, as, as advocacy and lobby push governments and remind them what they actually 
um, agreed to mm. rather than change anything. Okay, and I think there's a really important message for people listening worldwide here, is that the people who are in charge of the FCTC and how it's implemented and how it's developed, uh, what recommendations come with it, are the member states. And if you want to be influential, then you need to talk to the people in your home country capital and not try necessarily to badger people in Geneva because they're pretty unreceptive. But one or two countries that change their approach at home could make a big difference in the, in, in the FCTC COP yes. negotiation. Imagine, for example, a very pro-harm reduction country like the UK. Imagine the UK goes into that scenario and says, we actually think that um, using the process says, we think it would be really good to have um, a working group to develop guidelines on harm reduction, which Countries have done every time on guidelines for um, packaging and labelling, on guidelines for 5.3 interpretation. What about one in an area that's very much driven by pro-harm reduction? And then what if New Zealand and Philippines and all these countries that are starting to put harm reduction in start to say that to the, the FCTC's approach and you, you, you bring things along? So absolutely, Clive, I that's think that's the way okay. to go. Let, okay, let's, 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 we're going to come to Greg in a second, but we've got, a, we've got an interruption for a question. Yeah, from it was um, to Jeannie, actually. So the question was, um, could... Art I think this is really interesting because <laughs> if you go back to... But this, again, is where I think if you do the same activity on harm reduction, because mm. those guidelines, whilst the FCTC 5.3 article is legally binding, the guidelines are not legally binding. Mm. The guidelines are just there as guidelines of how governments should interpret it. So uh, if we made a, um, a guideline, uh, sorry, if we did um, the, the pro-harm reduction side, got a working group on tobacco harm reduction that pr produced sensible guidelines on direction, and then, you know, that, that that's using what has been done through the positive. But I think the problem is that that's all moving in the opposite 5.3, where, you know, the sort of ritualistic hatred of the tobacco industry and their spine uh, on, uh, it says basically don't let the tobacco industry, and you could say that about the airline industry. The guidelines, however, elevate that massively. Um, a fundamental and of the tobacco industry and the interests of public health. Uh, consequences of that into account, tobacco products, smokeless tobacco, can, because uh, Greg citing me, Greg, is the going to happen with the which are absolutist kind of approvals of vaping products, PM organizations for um, how is that going to change United States and potentially really sit around in a room together for the first time in, in far too long. Uh, the went into this in, in a lot of detail, where the delay hangover from the jewel panic, et cetera, has led to who are often the most important long, very long delay at the federal level in the United States. They are apt to see bad things happen to vaping, and they are willing to sacrifice uh, the idea of you don't want to give a competitive advantage to cigarettes, you don't want to uh, hurt adult smokers, you don't want to hurt small businesses. All of that is easily pushed aside when it comes to this issue at this moment. But we are starting to see some pushback to this idea of we can't trust the FDA. And we now have Matt Myers of the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, who helped co-write the Federal Tobacco Control Act, going out in Connecticut this week, Connecticut, one of our 50 states, they had a provision in their budget that had been negotiated that everyone had agreed on within the legislature that said no flavored vaping products would be allowed unless the product had approved, had rather had, a, had applied to the FDA for authorization through the PMTA process. And if a product did not get a PMTA, the product would be removed from the Connecticut market. We'd prefer different regulation than that, but that is certainly better than an all outright ban. In the 11th hour, Matt Myers comes out and gets the governor to demand that provision be removed. We need a full blown ban. And Matt Myers actually went to the press and said, we can't trust the FDA. Look at what they've done over the last couple of years. So this is the co-writer of the Tobacco Control Act saying this. And while the people who were gung ho about banning flavors, the FDA argument doesn't work much on them. But when you have more moderate people on this issue, people who haven't thought about this issue long and hard and spend their days 
thinking about ways to ban the products. This concept of you can't trust the FDA. Well, after a year and a half of COVID, where we now have a vaccine because, or multiple vaccines because of the FDA, where you have these people that they all have their own pet issue mm -hmm. in the state legislature that involves the importance of FDA regulation, the argument, uh, the argument of banning vaping flavors certainly is going to still have an impact, even if FDA tomorrow mm -hmm. approves or authorizes PMTAs. But slowly, we're starting to see some. Uh, inkling of an idea that, well, maybe the FDA shouldn't just be ignored on this issue. So there's yeah. a lot more to say, but um, I'm, I'm hopeful and optimistic to a, to a point that once FDA starts authorizing products, that you might start to see some thinking about this issue if it's presented uh, many, many times to the legislators and actually make them, force them to think about it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to open up an intriguing dynamic because the the opponents of harm reduction, the, the you know, the abstinence only lot, their basic tech tactic has been to portray this as a conflict between public health and people who care about children uh, versus the industry and usually the tobacco industry and, and one you know we know because of the reputational equities involved that can only end in in one result but if it's suddenly a tobacco control activist group against the fda that's a very significant change in that dynamic and that conflict and it won't be quite so easy for the editorial board of the New York Times or the Washington Post to just say, oh, well, you know, um, we're siding with uh, public health against the industry. So how do you think this will play out um, in the in the in the kind of Congress, because there's a, there's a lot of very hostile uh, legislation being floated by Congress. Do you think this will, that dynamic will, also challenge the senators a bit? To an extent, yes. But I will say that if there is someone in the audience or someone watching at home from Swedish Match, they're listening to this conversation and, and wanting to cry because they have had their MRTP, their modified risk tobacco product. If an individual switches to this product, it is less hazardous to your health for what, two, three years now? Well, in California, they went and they made that argument to legislators that, hey, we got an MRTPs. We did everything that you've told us to do, prove that our product is safer to the individual. We have, they don't even have a youth usage problem. Mm -hmm. And Swedish Match got nowhere. They got nowhere in California. They got nowhere in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And there is little to no indication that at the federal level, level that the idea of, okay, we should ban flavors, but let's have a carve out for products with PMTAs or products with MRTPs. Right now, there's no indication that that has happened with either uh, Swedish Matches, General Snooze, or ICOs. But those uh, Swedish Match and ICOs, they are not big media issues. When Swedish Match got their MRTPs, the first ever historical MRTP, no press coverage. Yeah. When ICOS yeah. was authorized through both the PMTA and the MRTP process, virtually no press coverage other than press coverage orchestrated by Bloomberg-funded groups saying this was a bad idea by FDA. But when FDA, hopefully within the next six months, actually authorizes some PMTAs for vaping products, and maybe, maybe it will not just be a tobacco-flavored views that they will be authorizing, you're going to see a torrent of news stories. And of course, many of them are going to be edged towards the, what is the FDA doing? How could they do this in this world where we uh, still have uh, youth using vaping products? But I think you're going to have some big thinkers that are going to start to question, is this yeah. doctrinal? All these products are bad. All these products need to be banned. And once you have some influential thinkers, and once you have a few legislators on both the left and the right that recognize this is an issue that maybe I can express some nuance on, uh, I have some hope that at the federal level, we'll start to have questions about, do we really want Senator Durbin's bill, for instance, to equalize, the goal at least, is to equalize all taxes between all tobacco products. And when we have a menthol cigarette and a flavored 
cigar ban pending an FDA, do we want to pass our own standalone bill just simply taking the FDA's uh, authority away and just banning all flavors and all tobacco and nicotine products? So this is a time post-COVID where the news has not been on vaping over the last 18 months. The health reporters have had uh, slightly bigger things to worry about, but I think we're going to see a return to this issue once FDA starts making decisions. That's great, Greg. I, I actually do think these are going to be very significant developments, and I think they'll have worldwide resonance because, you know, you say FDA says it's appropriate for the protection of public health. How does that square with everybody using the Article 5.3 guidelines to say there is a fundamental and irreconcilable conflict between the interests of the tobacco industry and public health? Those two things cannot exist together. One of them has to be wrong. And FDA will win that one, in my opinion. I'm going to go to Rebecca for questions. Have we got any? We have. Um, so one of the questions was about, um, I think more to, to Robin, about um, teen use, well, what about teenagers who already smoke? How do you, shouldn't they have access to reduced harm products? And I think it's very, very tricky. But anyway, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, no, I, I agree that they should have access to, to these products. Um, I'm, it's, it's a challenging situation because uh, policy often tries to be one size fits all, and that's not really how it works um, in practice. So uh, I, I think that by there are a lot of benefits in raising the age to 21 um, that we've seen in the states, but um, definitely feel for the people who are using um, those products as well as cigarettes who are kind of caught in that middle, um, even the, the adults between 18 and, and 21 no longer having access. Um, but what we've seen is uh, that there have been kind of um, products that have filled that vacuum and uh, there have been some um, disposable products that have been imported to the U.S. as well as uh, the rise of synthetic nicotine products uh, that you can get generally without being age verified. Um, and so that's, that's concerning to me um, and probably a predictable unintended consequence uh, of, of policies like that. But I think on the whole, um, Tobacco 21 will help to reduce both direct access and then social sourcing within schools. I think, I think with this, so it is a very tricky area, as you, as you suggested, Rebecca, but I think the first stage is to actually understand what's going on. And we happen to have researchers in the audience who've looked at whether vaping um, is a diversion from smoking for adolescents. And that finding is now pretty robust and it's been sort of, I think, repeated a couple of times. We've also seen evidence where vaping restrictions have been put in and we've seen smoking go up amongst adolescents. The recent paper uh, from uh, San Francisco. So I think the more we have evidence that suggests that smoking and vaping interact amongst adolescents, the less confident people are going to be about saying, well, we must do these things to protect adolescents because we could be doing things to expose them to greater harm. Now, it doesn't necessarily follow what the policy is from that. You don't say, well, we'll just make vaping available in all nursery schools. No, that doesn't necessarily follow from that. But it does mean that we have to be very wary of unintended consequences of excessive policies that bear down on vaping in order to protect adolescents, because a subset of adolescents may be harmed, uh, may, may well be harmed by that. And that is something that's been denied by most regulators. I think it's quite an important narrative that we say it's not adults, the interests of adult smokers versus tobacco naive adolescents. There are also the people who smoke or would otherwise smoke who are adolescents. They have interests and they have a dog in this fight as well. And in fact, they are the at risk population amongst adolescents. And we must stop ignoring them, which I think is what a lot of the regulators and certainly the, the state level legislatures have done. They just don't care at all about that. Do we have any more? Sorry. I was just going to make a, a point there, actually, because this was actually raised by my colleague Frederic in the TPD, in that we will eventually, and maybe it's already happened, see young people start vaping who would have otherwise started smoking. So they, there's not, obviously, the gateway massively disproved. Um, and I think it, it, it's kind of links to the same issue. You could see that a few years ago, that that will, at the time, you know, the ASH surveys, they found 
nobody basically who was not a smoker who was vaping or a few people who tried but you know going forward and yeah in terms of regulation I think that's a challenge because it's not something most regulators have thought of they've automatically yeah. thought in a different way yeah, you're absolutely right I mean there's a, the, the data on uh, women in Norway aged 16 to 24 is amazing in that respect uh, smoking prevalence is now down to one percent uh, amongst that demographic but use of snus amongst th that age group of women is around 16 percent so there's been a complete substitution or near complete substitution of snus use uh, sorry um, smoking by snus use in that age uh, in that age group and of course most of them never start to smoke in the first place it's not strictly speaking a harm reduction thing it's just that they've initiated their nicotine use differently on a much safer form of product again it's a it's a kind of challenge for regulators because they go well we are not reducing any harm here but you are in fact you reducing harm and would otherwise quickly, occur it comes to the fct oh sorry sorry greg you go first and then Jeannie. Thank you. I'll just quickly add that from a science perspective, I think the evidence is clear that particularly in the United States, that youth who were at risk to smoke or youth who uh, would have otherwise smoked, that they have been diverted away to vaping products. I think uh, Kenneth Warner and others have, have made that clear in the science. But from a policy perspective, sometimes to make an omelet, you have to crack a few eggs. And when you're looking at population level health, the most important thing are that these products are available to the 40, 50, 60 year old yeah. smokers. The 16 year old who picks up Marlboro and keeps using it has many years to eventually switch over. So in America, I was reluctant to support Tobacco 21, but ultimately youth use got to such a level that the very future of the product itself and its availability to older smokers was being threatened. And so to me, uh, the the what we received, which is potentially five or more percentage points of youth vaping going down, hopefully even more uh, decreasing in 2021, we'll know in a couple months, the risk of a small percentage of them smoking is worth the yep. fact that we can go to legislators in this tumultuous time and say, we just saw a big decline. Hopefully we're going to see another big decline. So you who are especially worried about the youth and not so much worried about those adult smokers, you can take solace in this fact. Well, I, w I was going to say that in the FCTC there is one article, I can't remember if it's 16 or 14, but um, it's about uh, youth. It's specifically on youth. And I think this is why all of the governments that negotiated that put that into place, 181, as I said before, have legal obligations there. They have implemented that. It prevents, for, this of course was done on smoking, but you know, um, no vending machines, um, no um, billboards near schools, all of the things that we have seen rolled out in terms of youth access to cigarettes and 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 is 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 very much written in there clearly and anyone who read that article you, there is nothing you would object to in terms of and and governments have done that very well i think now we're you know we're at the stage where there's you know newer products do governments just continue what they have done and implemented there uh, for those countries that are parties to the fctc i think that works very well because it is very very strong it's one of the strongest areas in the fctc I just want to pick up a point that Greg made, which I think is incredibly important, is to keep an eye on the actual, from a public health point of view, the actual at-risk population is smokers uh, you know, entering their 40s or older uh, with a consolidated smoking habit. They are the people at uh, immediate and rapidly increasing risk of serious disease and reduced life expectancy. And Greg is right, you, you, in policy terms, you should be willing to sacrifice things to protect their access to reduced harm products. I think that's quite a really quite important tactical observation. So, uh, for example, uh, on flavours, I, I find if flavours themselves are actually harmful, fine. Uh, you know, they've got some nasty chemical in them, fine, don't allow them. Um, if there's a flavour descriptor that looks silly uh, or is, looks as though it's aimed at kids, fine, ban the descriptor. But in terms of the flavours themselves, the things that actually appeal fundamentally to the users then protect those because they're important for the experience of vaping. So that's how I've interpreted the, 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 the kind of message that uh, Greg was giving there. Rebecca, do you want another question? Yes. And then we'll go to the, I want some questions from the audience. You know, hands up, please, if you don't Can mind. Can I add something quickly, Clark? 
Sorry, oh, go, but, uh, go yeah, I, I think. Um, Considering adults who smoke, uh, particularly older smokers, is incredibly important. Um, one of my colleagues, Annie Claycamp, has done a lot of work on this. And uh, what we find is that their risk perceptions are much worse, and it's right. not trending in a good direction in America uh, generally. But um, older smokers have the harder, hardest time giving up, hardest time switching, um, and worse misperceptions. And it, it really feels like uh, we're just leaving them behind and forgetting them. Okay. All right. Let's let's go through some rapid fire questions. Let's, let's yeah. you this start hitting one, as Rebecca. Can. Yeah, this is one probably more for um, Greg. The FDA has been under attack for some controversial drug approvals. Do you think that has an impact in relation to uh, reduced harm tobacco products? It's a good question, and I'm not sure how that is going to shake out yeah. yet. Big question around FDA, I think, um, off of that question. Janet Woodcock, who is the acting commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration, she is an institutionalist. She's been around the FDA for probably two decades, three decades. She, if more than anything, I would rely on her to say to the FDA Center for Tobacco Products, you have a job to do under the statute, you do it, it is your job, Mitch Zeller, and I'm not going to interfere. My worry, my big worry coming out of that controversial approval decision is that it could lead to President Biden actually feeling the need to nominate a commissioner to the FDA, and then we could end up in a position where there is an activist FDA commissioner uh, like Josh Sharfstein, who was uh -oh. one of the first <laughs> FDA employees to ban e-cigarettes all the way back in 2009. If he gets nominated and gets put in as FDA commissioner, he's going to want a legacy item on tobacco, and just just merely banning menthol cigarettes and flavored cigars won't be enough for someone like Sharfstein. So, so to summarize, the, the, the risk is a really an indirect one, that that controversy will generate new personnel and those personnel will be risky. Rebecca, another question. Um, yes, there was one to um, Jeannie about FCTC from, uh, from New Zealand. Um, so should FCTC align along with other UN treaties and declarations, like the Declaration on the Rights of um, Indigenous Peoples? It's not a question. I, it's not an area I know anything yeah, about. Well, in fact, the FCD, FCTC preamble um, provisions for Indigenous people uh, and um, the New Zealand, Australia, Canada and the United States fought very strong to include that in there because, yeah. as we heard earlier this morning, indigenous, the um, t tobacco and, and smoking-related uh, uh, problems um, manifest very significantly in that, those populations. So, um, so, yes, it is in there and it, it and then therefore everything within the FCTC um, covers for that, as, as well as all of the human rights issues and the, you know, the right yeah. to, to health and um, protection of exposure to health. It specifically mentions Indigenous peoples and, and gender. But I, I think this kind of highlights uh, a, a, both a feature and a bug in the FCTC. In a sense, there's language there that, you know, you can operationalise into anything. You know, you could operationalize it into very pro-harm reduction measures. You could use indigenous people and their very high smoking rates to, to argue for a, 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 you know, a tobacco harm reduction regime. The problem is it's not worked in that way. And in, in a sense, their interests, although the language is there, it's kind of dormant that's where, in terms of where the measures are. That's where it requires political will. If you look yeah. at the Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the other big um, uh, framework treaty, um, look at the political will that's there, COP26 yeah. this year. The world is focused on it. It's about moving from combustion um, to, to non-combustion in terms of the cars mm -hmm. we drive, the boilers we use, all of that. Yeah. Because the political will and the energy industry and all of that is all behind it, when you come to this framework convention on, um, on tobacco control, the political will needs to be there. And that's where, you know, the push needs to happen because it also is about driving away from dirty combustion of smoking to the less harmful options. Exactly the same analogy. Okay. Rebecca, another question. Is anyone in the audience so, live here in Liverpool? Yeah. Somebody been signaling. There we go. Um, get behind the mic. We'll keep the questions brief. We're coming in, we're coming into the last sort of few minutes, uh, well, 15 minutes or so. So let's keep them brief and let's get snappy answers from the panel. Yeah, it's a question uh, probably for Jeannie, really, but um, 
discretion in use is a growing consumer trend uh, with e-cigarettes, but it was also one of the accusations levelled at Juul uh, as to why it was uh, uh, perceived to be attractive to underage. Do you think there's a threat to uh, discreet use e-cigarettes, pod mods, and how do we design products so that they are not perceived to be uh, attractive in this way? Um, Is that more for you or for me? Either of you. Oh. <laughs> I'm happy to... Robin, why don't you take yeah. that one and then... Robin, and you... Yeah, um, I think that the, uh, like, kind of abuse liability features, um, pro like, features of a product that uh, appeal to adults also appeal to other people as well. So, I mean, when you talk to people who smoke, they do like having... Um, a, a more discreet option, and, and certainly a lot of people, including people in this room, you know, having the bigger tank systems um, really does work uh, for them. Um, but others want something that's that's a little um, easier to use and easier to carry around. So um, I definitely think uh, those features can be beneficial in an alternative um, to smoking and, and trying to make sure that it's uh, as easy to use as a cigarette. I would just add that I think, to me, from a regulatory perspective, the line needs to be between combustion and non-combustion, and all products that are on the, um, the non-combustible side, you know, regardless, we need to allow for innovation in that area. We need to allow, you know, one, one size does not fit all. Consumers want different options, and um, industry and, and those that continue to make those you know, so much the better. I don't think we can get into, you know, defining how things or what or whatever. If we can, if we can ensure that the products and that continuum of risk and that those are on the, the spectrum of non-combustion side of things can, can work, I think there's going to be options and, and innovative way for, ways forward for, for everyone. But that regulatory line is so important and that's why I was making the point yesterday. You know, we need, the tide will rise for everybody if those regulations um, land between combustion and non-combustion, rather than between tobacco and nicotine and all these other things. And if we can be solid on that, then it's an opportunity for many products that can help smokers switch. All right. Yeah, I hope you're right. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Rebecca, another question from a, the global audience, Yeah, please. there was actually a question to me. Oh. Um, <laughs> which was, uh, you were an MEP at the time the TPD, TPD's up for review, what would you change? First of all, please read the excellent letter from uh, Clive and others at Unicotine Alliance, because most of it's in there. But this would include taking away the 20 milligram limit, changing the warnings. They are a bit scary, but um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we had to get it through Parliament. We had to get we had to get it approved. So unfortunately, it wasn't the text I would have wanted or Frederic. We thought it was a bit too harsh, but you know, this is like real politics. This is how things happen. But I think uh, the principle is there in, yeah. in the TPD, the Tobacco Products Directive in Recital 38, where it requires and says the principle is that, you know, nicotine should be there, um, delivered, you know, uh, in a way that enables it to compete with um, a, uh, yeah. a, a combustible cigarette. Yeah. Therefore, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, it should yeah. be 20 milligrams. That, that was a mistake that was made yeah. in terms of it is not anywhere c uh, close to what a cigarette it's delivers. Comparable, and therefore, it? given that there is a TPD review, uh, it ought to be, um, you know, be looked at in, in that policy context. I, th I think if, it, if there was a way of summarising the big change that needs to happen in European regulation, pick up on uh, Jeannie's point from, uh, from the, the last but one question, which, which is that you basically need the three big European directives, so, so tobacco products, tobacco advertising and tobacco excise directives, need to be orientated to distinct, make the critical distinction between combustible and non-combustible rather than between tobacco and non-tobacco. Yeah. That, that is the breakthrough in thinking that's, that needs to be required. The thing that needs to be problematized is combustion, not necessarily tobacco itself. It needs to be a much more liberal agenda around the non-combustible 
products in terms of the regulatory environment, the fiscal environment, and the information environment, and a stiff or as stiff one as we have now with the combustible products. And that, I think, is how you would get a rational reform of EU regulation in this area. But that, that's going to be one monumental battle. Yeah, and definitely. I think poor Rebecca still has the, uh, the, sh <laughs> the scars and shrapnel from the... Uh, <laughs> yeah. from Pulling the knives out of my back. Um, there's another question here, which I don't think is aimed to any particular member of the panel, so whoever feels they can answer it would be, would be good. The UK is the only country that tracks how many adult smokers have quit completely with safer nicotine, 2.1 million. Um, CDC has some data. How can these be more widely known? And I think in a, in a regulatory context, this is adding to your kind of evidence base, of like, look, it's a switch, you know, towards a it's tobacco harm reduction, essentially. Can we maybe get a view from Greg on that? Cause he's yeah. So I remember a couple of years ago at one of the DC conferences, I asked Dr. Brian King of the CDC, will you endeavor to actually add a question to your year, one of your yearly surveys that would allow us to give a really firm estimate how many ex-smokers are vaping mm -hmm. and how many consider vaping to have helped them quit smoking and then how many ex-smokers who are also no longer vaping credit vaping with helping them quit smoking because right now we just have data on how many ex-smokers who quit in the last year in the United States are vaping in that prior month and you can take from that, well, my 90% plus of them likely quit with vaping, but you can't say that with scientific certainty. And Dr. Brian King essentially said no. Um, so my hope is that someone like the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World or the FDA's PATH survey uh, will give us much better data from a nationwide perspective so we can actually put, because legislators, policymakers, they like nice big numbers. And to be able to give them a number with no caveats, this is what the FDA, this is what the CDC says, the number of adults who have quit with this product, that will be a big help. So I'm, I'm hopeful that that I, will come. I, I think this raises a massive point, which is, we're talking here about regulation, but what's the data and evidence base that sits behind regulation? Yeah. And, and one of the things I find astonishing about the United States is how slow the data is to come out uh, and how much scrubbing and so on has to happen. So you get data that's, you know, years out of date. The EU publishes uh, a survey, the Eurobarometer survey, did the field work in September and the report was um, published this March in 21 separate languages in 20, 28 countries. Um, and it's all there in a massive report with all the data sets all, all available. The UK has essentially real time, near real time tracking of smoking prevalence in the smoking toolkit survey. I mean, it's like, come on, United States, you've got like $712 million a year go into the FDA from the tobacco industry. For goodness sake, have some surveillance. And then the other thing, I'm sorry, I'll end this rant in a second, but <laughs> policy research, intervention, you know, we put in a ban on flavors or we raise taxes. What happened? Because I tell you what, the campaign for tobacco free kids and the Bloomberg lot, they get the policy and then they're off to the next battle. They're not hanging around to find out what actually happened and go, oops, we made a terrible mistake. We better reverse that. Mm. That doesn't happen, but it needs to happen in the, in the regulatory environment. And we need to get proper assessment of these regulatory interventions because the whole field is laden with unintended consequences. End of rant. Next question. Yeah. Um, this is also, I think, probably slightly related to the TPD, but not entirely. Is it time for bespoke regulation that is neither tobacco product or sort of pharmaceutical? And this was something that was raised at the time of the TPD, like because e-cigarettes got kind of stuck into it at the last minute. There was a kind of like, no, we need to do a separate type of regulation. This needs to be done specifically. I think in the terms of the TPD, I don't think you're gonna be able to do that. I think it should have happened at the time, couldn't. So yeah, do you think that's A, a good thing, and also how realistic is it? So put it, Robin, if you were the king of the world mm -hmm. and you could devise the regulatory framework that you wanted, and I thought we'll put this to each of you. In brief, what kind of features would it would it have uh, if you if you could design the perfect regulatory regime bespoke? What would it need to do? Okay, you don't have um, to do the whole thing. You can each 
contribute a bit. All right, so I'd be the queen of the world. Um, and just to specifically answer kind of whether there's a third way, I mean, it, it does seem like the notification system under the TPD really does work for a lot of manufacturers and certainly isn't as burdensome um, as the, the FDA process is. I mean, you could consider having for products that do want to notify with something higher than that 20 migs, you know, a PK test or some other way of showing that you're still delivering nicotine at a lower um, level. But but um, thinking bigger picture, uh, I think, um, you know, in talking about policy, uh, setting your goal is incredibly important. So for me, it's reducing combustible use as, as quickly as possible. So making sure that these products can compete with cigarettes um, on that 3D continuum from uh, Abrams that we all love so much and um, making sure that there are product features that enable that. All right, so you're, you're, you've got to, we want, we want to regulate so that we have the non-combustibles as, as aggressive competitors to the combustibles. Jeannie, yeah, same sort of thing I'd, or something I'd else? I'd agree with that, and I do agree um, with Robin also on the notification system versus the authorization system. As in the, Europe and most of the world, UK, and, you know, so it's basically, here's a set of standards, essentially, and any company that can meet them, whether it's a small startup or, a, you know, a big company like Jewel, can, um, can put its products. It's fairer, it's quicker, yeah. um, and it just enables things to happen, and it, but, it, but it does it within a framework of, of of allowable things. So I, I think um, process-wise, it, it's, it's got benefits. I agree with Robin. Um, and yeah, I, I think... I, I, again, I think Jeannie's hit on a really important point here. Authorization systems require somebody in authority, a regulator, to say yes to something, mm. and they hate doing that. Um, particularly with it when it's, uh, you know, if you like, a, 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 a essentially a drug product or a recreational yeah. product. So the notification regime backed up by standards that says you can put the product on the market if it meets these standards and you notify it, that's a good regulatory system. I'm going to go to Greg. Yep. In this world where I am king, I can't help but think that both of my queens gave excellent answers. <laughs> if you give people access to satisfying products, if you give them accurate information, I truly believe that people, the vast majority of them, will end up making the right choice for their health if they can get that same satisfaction. So give people accurate information, give them real products have a, a form of regulation that can give people some certainty and some security, but don't go overboard. So I, again, I think Greg brings in a really important point. Part, part of the, the sort of ecosystem of influences that bear on people's choices about what they actually do is what I would call the information environment. What, a, what, it, what is said about these products? What is communicated about the risks and dangers? How do people feel about them? And we know that the risk perceptions are way off base for these products compared to what the, you know, the best scientific consensus is on them. So I think paying attention to the information environment when you design a regulatory framework really important not having excessive warnings having messages that encourage switching and so on really really important Rebecca do, do you have a thought on this or on this whole idea about what you would if you were if you were if, if, if you were you know a president of the European Council mm -hmm. um, or Unlikely. king of Europe um, what would you what, what would you think about doing with this or what would you have liked to have done in 2013 yeah. 14 that you couldn't do yeah I mean I I was sort of in favor of doing it in a separate a specific regulation because I felt it just got squished into tobacco products it and then treat it as a pharmaceutical. It's not pharmaceutical, it's not a tobacco product, it's something else. So, but I'm not sure if that ship has kind of sailed. It just, there wasn't really enough time yeah. to do that because it got stuck in at the last minute. If we'd known before, then maybe that would have been the time to do it. But I think, as I say, look at the letter that NNA sent to the UK Department of Health, and I think there's quite, there's very sensible, practical um, suggestions in there. There was another question. Jen. Let's have another There's, question. Any more yeah. in the audience here, by the way? Because we're, we're, we're getting right close to the end. It needs to be a short and snappy question with short and snappy okay. answers. 
No, it's going to be a long one, a long and tedious question. We won't have that. Well, I think one of the okay. things we shouldn't forget, though, is consumers. And I think um, the power of consumers and, and the products that they want and need. I mean, you would have seen in Europe um, what happened when the consumers yeah. banded together and actually yeah. uh, enabled the product to continue to be a yeah. consumer product rather than be a yeah. medicinal product. And I think that should not be underestimated um, uh, in, in, in any type of um, regulatory process. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think it's important that you know, regulators avoid just using off-the-shelf regulatory systems like pharmaceutical poisons, just treat these products as if they're cigarettes because they're not, they're much yeah. less dangerous. Um, and so don't go there with that, with that just, you know, we'll just slot it into something that's, you know, makes it a square peg in a round hole. Yeah, I think Did, just, sorry. that was just a quick, oh, it, you know, nicotine, nicotine. Yeah. I think it was just a quick copy paste and not too much thinking and, and involved. Very, very, the pharmaceutical industry. Very, let's get another question from yeah. the global uh, audience. So there was one more the, question the global here, audience. which is about FCTC, so I think it's, it's more aimed at Genie. Has there been any study on the efficacy of different um, FCTC-inspired, I guess you could say, measures, um, in, including the impact on the quality of life of smokers of some of those measures? Well, um, I mean, one of the things with um, treaties in, in, in terms of their effectiveness, there's, there's three measures for it. Um, one is, um, have the countries and the governments been legally compliant with the obligations that they have? And, and you could argue, um, and, and you know, that most of those governments that are parties to it have pretty much done most of what is in there. And what is missing is the, the harm reduction bit. They haven't really pulled that out and done with it. The, the second one is, um, um, you know, has it has it solved the um, you know the political problem? Um, and and the last one is has it um, has it solved the problem? I think on the on the the two the the two first um, measures of effectiveness, um, the FCTC has worked, but has it solved the problem? No, it hasn't. And 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 I think the measure of whether um, the FCTC um, has um, protected you know its objective protects. Uh, protect people from exposure to tobacco smoke. No, that is, there's still a lot of room there to, for that to be to be done. But I mean, it, it, the things that it set out to do 20 years ago, um, it, it has made a change to bringing smoking down. It's just that it was done at a time where there wasn't these other newer options. Mm. They've come in and although, you know, they, they are being, they are making, and if we are gonna get to smoke free 2030 in places, mm. as you were saying earlier, Clive, you know, these things need to be fast tracked and the, the things like, um, as, as Greg said, um, um, the ability to communicate and give consumers accurate information and have access to information, a lot of that, those, those opportunities were closed off in terms of being able to speak about it for smoking, but they almost need to be opened up now for newer products because it is still in the context of the objective of the treaty. All right. Well, talking of we are we are at the end of our our time here. Just I want to quick follow up on Jeannie's point. The there is a there is a global goal to reduce um, smoking or tobacco use, as it's expressed in the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, Sustainable Development Goal 3.4 requires a 30% reduction in tobacco use by 2030, and they are way off target for that way off target. So uh, there is some pressure from external targets to do something different and better at the international level than they, they have been doing. Um, but I'm going to wrap up there. Uh, I want to thank our panel, Robin, Jeannie, Greg, and our, our host, hostess, co-host, uh, Rebecca. And uh, I'd like to uh, say hello from Liverpool, say goodbye and the end of this session from uh, Liverpool. Thank you all for tuning in uh, internationally. Thank you for uh, your participation uh, here in Liverpool. And that's it. We're closing the session. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>